Hey lovely freaks and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host Amanda. And I'm Hannah. And if you're new here, hi, welcome. If you like things strange and unusual and true crime, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe or follow button. You can also head down to the description box and you'll see a link that will take you to our link tree. And there you can find our Instagram at Lovely Freaks Podcast, Facebook, and all that jazz. And all that jazz. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so um, just want to tell you guys right off the bat, this week is a new episode, but next week we're only going to have a Friday episode, and it won't be a new one. It'll be an older one that we have on our YouTube, but we don't have it yet on our Spotify or anything like that. So we're kind of taking a break for a week. Um, my husband's leaving the 25th of May to go somewhere for a month for training. So we're going to spend some time with him and enjoy that, have some family time. So I definitely don't want to... Um, have to yeah have to do research and <clears throat> all that stuff while you know he's here he's here whatever um <laughs> and also so, sorry i'm sick so if you yeah if hear you something hear congestion a sneeze a cough something like that just ignore it yeah i'm even i've even got a little bit of a drainage in the back of my throat because it's you know um well it's not it's supposed to be almost summer here in Mississippi, but it's more like spring weather right now, so everything yeah. in God's green earth of Mississippi is blooming. Yeah. <laughs> and the allergies, man, they're intense this year. Like, they're bad. Um, we're also outside, so if you hear other things like that, then um, that's what it is. So, we are today, if you saw the title, then you know what we're going to talk about. And I'm pretty excited to talk about this. Today we're going to talk about... Basically, The Conjuring 3 movie, um, The Devil Made Me Do It, and it's actually a true story. I will say that from the trailer, I got a sense that they were going to take it again in the direction of a witch. This doesn't have anything to do with a witch, but it is pretty freaking crazy, and um, yeah. So, I don't know. I'm excited to see the movie, though, even though they might take it in that direction. I'm kind of over the whole witchy thing like yeah you know we get it <laughs> but um like we talked about in the regular conjuring we 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 went over that case and um you know it didn't have anything to do with the witch the the people that live there said that they didn't think there was a witch involved or anything like that and then the the woman that supposedly was supposed to be the witch there was no evidence to support that so yeah. i don't know we'll see how the movie turns out but um yeah so this is an ed and lorraine lauren case and we're just going to hop right in. So we are going to be in Brookfield, Connecticut. This murder took place on February 16th, 1981. Arnie Johnson killed Alan Bonin. Bo Bono. Sorry. I, wanna, I always want to say that. But then I remember it's Bono, like from you two. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so Alan Bono. Um, this was also the first case in the U.S. history where someone used demonic possession as their defense for committing murder. Hmm. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, we're going to kind of, we're going to start where it all began. Because it began with David Glatz, Glatzel. Glatzel? Yeah. If I'm saying that wrong, I'm so sorry. But, okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to throw a lot of names at you guys, but I'm going to try to not make it so confusing because it gets a little confusing at some times. But here we go. In 1980, Debbie Gatz Glatzel, I always want to say Gatzel and I can't stop saying that. Um, Debbie Glatzel and Arnie Johnson, the, murder, the murderer in this case, uh, they were dating, and they decided to move in together, along with Arnie's mom and sisters. They were going to move into this, like, rental house that they found in Brookfield. And Debbie's parents, the Glatzels, David's mm. mom, um, they didn't live very far from this. They lived, like, not that far. It was, they kind of lived in the country area. So, yeah, they were all pretty close, you know. I mean, this was a small town in Connecticut, small area. When they first got to the rental house they were going to move into, um, there was a few things left by the tenants. One of the things that was left by the tenants was a waterbed, which 
everybody thought, you know, was really cool because, you know, water beds were like the thing back in the yeah. 80s. Now I'm like, ugh, this messy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so while the boys, David and his brother, while they were up, Carl, Carl Jr. is his brother's name. He's older. And we'll get to all that. But while they were upstairs jumping on the bed, they were just playing around. They were horse playing, you know, and all this. And then all of a sudden they heard the door slam shut behind them. So they got kind of freaked out, but they went over to the door and they were trying to open it and they couldn't open it. So it was like, you know, locked, basically. Mm -hmm. Couldn't open the door. They're struggling. Uh, the boys eventually started screaming and freaking out. And then all of a sudden the door opened. So they just thought, okay, that was really weird. Maybe it was, it's an older house. So maybe there's just some kinks that need to be worked out and something. <clears throat> then when David, the youngest, was cleaning, he saw what he described as an old man. He also said he was beast-like. He had deep black eyes, thin face, animal-like features, like on some, some of his parts were animal-like features. He also had rotten teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. Hmm. The old man, slash demon, that's what I'm going to call it, um, pushed him onto the bed and then disappeared. Like, this is all in the first, like, first minutes of them getting there and cleaning the house and everything cleaning this re rental house and everything so the demon also started telling david if they move into this house he will hurt them the next morning um he told his sister and his mom that he was seeing an old man and what he looked like and everything and they told him that he was just had an overactive imagination at first. That's what they were saying. Like, oh, you're just imagining things, you know, whatever. David tells Arnie, Arnie Johnson, um, his sister's boyfriend, <laughs> yeah. um, tells Arnie what's he, what he is experiencing. And Arnie kind of starts believing him a little bit, but is still a little skeptical too. So Debbie, David's sister, that's her, that's who Debbie is. Um, she asked one of the tenants that used to live there if they had ever experienced anything unusual. And the woman was like, well, actually, yes. She said that the tenant told her that she was moving because there was a creepy old man that she kept seeing walking around, like, the place. Um, another example she gave was that she often would hear people whisper her name in the night. So this is the second day, right? Mm. At this point, they do what most all of us would just decide to do and they're like okay well we gotta go like <laughs> thank god yeah so Finally they're smart. like okay we're gonna leave you know this is we're not gonna stay here because something's wrong with this apartment however arnie's mom had already moved out of her apartment mm -hmm. and had put the down payment on the rental house so she was like pulling up into the driveway basically and they were like leaving and she's like i'm gonna i'm just gonna i don't have anywhere else to go so i'm gonna stay here so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the vibe that I got, I couldn't really find anywhere specifically, but I think that Arnie's mom stayed there and the sisters, and then Arnie, Debbie, David, his mom, and everybody else went back to David's house. And maybe Arnie was kind of going in between the rental house and their house. I don't know, but he was at he was at the ranch house a lot towards the end, anyways. Um. So, over the next few days, back at the Glatzel house, where David was, paranormal things started happening to David pretty much all the time. He said that when he closed his eyes, he could see an old man coming from out of the well that was underneath, like, in the yeah. basement of the rental house. Yeah. He saw an Gross. old man coming from out of the well from the rental house in Newtown and flew above the trees to come to their house in Brookfield. So, yeah, the rental so, house was in Newtown, and they it were... It seems like it's Brookfield. just an old man. Like, one of the ghosts are an old man? Well, kind of, but you gotta remember, he did say that he described him with having horns and hooves, ah. and so, yeah. Okay. I'm pretty, almost positive, you know, it's a demon. Mm -hmm. David was scared to death, obviously, and he would beg his family 
for protection because he said that the, he said that the the old man's coming to get him. Like he kept saying, he's co- he's going to come to our house. He's going to come to our house. And everybody, even if they did believe him and believe in spirits or ghosts or demons or whatever, they were probably thinking, well, that was at the other house. Like we're fine here. We're fine here. You know. Yeah. Um. So. I need to say, of course, the rental house was super old. It was built in, like, the 1800s. So, just keep that in mind. But, at the end of this, you're going to figure out why the demon possessed them. And it's crazy. And we'll get there. So, finally, after this, David, um, David's fits of terror were, like, terrifying mom. Judy, his mom. Debbie and Arnold started believing that maybe something was actually going on, too. Judy was kind of a religious person, and she started splashing holy water on all the doors and the windows and trying to, like, keep the demon from getting in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, There was one night where she was... David kept saying, he's coming. Like, he's coming tonight. And then all of a sudden, they all said that they heard, like... um, boxes being moved in the attic and stuff like that Mm. because she had she had done holy water on all the windows and all the doors and so then they heard like bang up in the attic and then boxes and stuff being moved around like almost like the demon was there and it was in the attic so david said that at this time the demons were now in the glatzel home and he followed that by saying that they were the same ones from the rental home he also claimed that there were 40 Excuse me, hiccups. <laughs> he also claimed that there were 42 demons and the old man demon with him. Like, they were all together, I guess. A little odd, but okay. But also, you gotta remember, David's 11. So, I don't know if I mentioned that. He's 11. So, he's younger. Also, Debbie and Arnie. So, Arnie's like 19. Debbie is like 25. 26 and they met when she was like 20 or 19 and he was 12 yeah it's a little odd it's a little weird like they met at a they met at a store she was working at like there was a display or something and it fell over and he started helping her pick it up and then they started I don't know if they started dating or they just started liking each other. That's I don't know. Weird. They have, yeah, that's right. They just started liking each other. They officially started dating when he was sixteen and she was like twenty three. No. Yeah, it's weird. No. <laughs> that be that like would be you like dating me. a sixteen year old. Yeah, dating a six year old. Fuck. No. <laughs> yeah. Would never. So it's just a little odd tidbit to throw in there. Got way off track. But anyways, um so the demons that had all made it to the Glat Glatzel house. There were 42 of them, and they would constantly tease and taunt David. David would also describe in detail that these what these demons looked like. David would have lashes on him, handprints, bruises all over his body. Sometimes his family would see him um, kind of like seem like he was being choked or he couldn't breathe. And then once he would start breathing again, they would see that there were like handprints, like you know somebody yeah. was choking him. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the father, Carl Sr., he didn't really witness any of this at first. He worked, and the older brother, um, David's older brother, Carl Jr., he also, like, was hardly ever there. So they kind of didn't believe that any of this was going on. However, his mother, though, Judy, was scared, and she finally reached out to the Catholic Church. But they decided not to help right away. However, they did contact Ed and Lorraine Warren. So, the priest was like, we can't really, I don't really know why they weren't wanting to help, but they contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren and were like, hey, this family, you know, this family needs your help. Can you go out there? Blah, blah, blah. So, at the time, they, Ed and Lorraine had just done the Amneville case, um, probably like a few years before this or maybe like a year before this i don't know but they they had just gotten off of that case so they were pretty well known in the paranormal community anyways so the warrens head to the glatzel house i'm probably saying that wrong but whatever they head to david's house the little boy um to help this little boy and she claimed uh lorraine did she claimed while they were on the way to the house that she had a feeling that they were about to begin a very dangerous case. She said, quote, 
When the priest called, he told us about this case, about the strange things that were being, that have been happening. There is definitely something wrong, and I believe it could be possession. So July 9th, 1980, they arrive at the Glatzel house. Um, <clears throat> from the moment they arrived, something was clearly off, and this is what Ed and Lorraine say. Um, something tried to trip Ed and this fellow doctor that they had with him. Of yeah. like when they were going up the stairs, they felt like something grabbed their ankles, and they both like tripped on the front steps, which is really odd. When entering the home, uh, L- Lorraine said that the tension in the air was super thick. You could just like feel the the. I mean, you know, we know That's something. Yeah, you know how it is when yeah. you walk in a house there. You feel like something's just off. Yeah. They had a dark, dark. Sorry, they had a doctor with them. Like I said, it was actually a doctor that was going to try to make sure that David wasn't mentally ill. So he apparently had a learning disability, not anything serious, like, but he just had some sort of learning disability. I never figured out what it was. I don't know if maybe it was, I don't know. When I think of learning disability, I think of like dyslexia or something like yeah. that. So I'm not really sure what it was, but the doctor evaluated him and he could not see any signs of mental illness and he said he was medically perfect like he was fine must be dyslexia or something something i don't know they interviewed everyone in the home except carl senior and carl jr obviously because they weren't there and they didn't really believe in it so you know they were like okay you guys have fun with your spooky shit we're gone (laughs) so lorraine would say that sometimes while they were talking to david he would start to look up at them and his face was distorted so bad that he was no longer recognizable as a little boy she also um, said that she would see a black mist around him constantly, like hovering around him. Mm-hmm. While they were talking to David, the demons were getting upset, obviously, because there was like a lot of poltergeist activity that started happening. Things were flying around the room, loud bangs. Um, <laughs> even at one point, like a cake smashed into the ceiling, and, like the icing got all over the ceiling. I was thinking, what? damn, rude ass. You gonna clean that up? Like, I'd be pissed. Um, so anywho, just, you know, our normal possession, we've went over all these, they're kind of all the same, yeah. so I'm just trying to, like, give you a general overview of this. Then the demon started speaking through David. The demon claimed that he was Satan himself, and nothing could drive him out. David didn't seem completely possessed yet, however, so there are You know, we've talked about the four stages of possession. Yeah. And David seemed to be on the third one. So, he wasn't quite possessed yet, but the Warrens did fear that it was, like, very soon. They tried to gather as much evidence as they could to see whether or not this was a real type of haunting possession. So, they con- then they contacted the Catholic Church. Because, you know, we've talked about this before in their cases. That's what they do. They, like, yeah. go gather evidence to try to see if the Catholic Church will help them do an exorcism. Mm-hmm. While waiting on the church to get back with them, things got worse. Shadows were seen all over the house. Hooved footprints were found, like, everywhere, pretty much. Things were constantly flying around the room. Carl Jr. finally started experiencing the wrath of the demons. He would lash out at his mom he would even hit her and his sister he would also try to get the family to like argue and rile them up and start fights you know the family was just being tormented constantly david was sleep deprived he actually had like chunks of his hair missing because the they would be pulled out and i don't know if they were pulled out by the demons or what he would get maybe by himself he would get thrown across the room so, this is things that we've heard about, like, in the first um, Conjuring. In most yeah, stories, in the first yeah. Conjuring that we did. You know, that... Sounds I can't even similar. think of it right now. The family. I can't even think of it. All I think of is the Feos, and that's Amityville. But anyways, that family, they, mm-hmm. um, you know, they had a lot of similar things as well. Arnie Johnson was this, like, this whole time um, was living in the house with them. Uh, it was said that he would pray for David and he would also try to taunt the demons to come out of David and get into him because he was strong enough to take it. He was mad and he would tell them, you know, leave this little boy alone. I think he said, leave this little lad alone, like get out of him. You know, I'm stronger. I can take it. And then David would just tell him they're laughing at you. Like he would just say they're laughing at you. Like the demons, they're just laughing at you. David would also speak Bible verses. 
<clears throat> and this is not somebody, like, he's not a kid that reads the Bible often, but he would read Bible verses like he had been reading them since birth. Like, he was a preacher. <laughs> um, he would also speak in Latin. Yet another thing, and obviously he didn't speak it. Ed and Lorraine even contacted the police and told them to watch Arnie because he was taunting the demons and they were scared that if the demons did possess him, he was older and so they were worried that if the demons possessed him, they he could do a lot more damage yeah. as far as like hurting someone or himself than 11 year old David could. Yeah. So they were, they kept telling him too, they were like, please don't, you know, don't taunt the demons, don't, um, you know, you don't need to do that. Yeah. But he wasn't listening. On September 8th, David became completely possessed of an, fine, you know, obviously, it was only a matter of time. And his face was distorted so that no one would recognize him. His stomach was bloated and doubled in size. He attacked his family with knives, fireplace pokers. He was so out of control that he even held his grandmother at knife point while she was praying for him. He also had to be tackled to the ground by Arnie and his older brother. Like, they wrapped him in a sheet to try to, like, keep him from harm harming anybody. A statement that was caught on tape. So, this is kind of important because this got brought up in trial. So, they have on tape, like, recorder. Like, tape recorder. Because, yeah. you know, Ed and Lauren and Lauren have taped all their stuff. Yeah. They have David... Um, not speaking in his normal voice, so we can assume that it's probably, mm -hmm. like, the demon speaking through him. He wasn't speaking in tongues as well. He wasn't speaking in tongues. Well, I guess at one point he was, maybe. He was speaking Latin. Yeah, That's Latin. not tongues. But, so, <clears throat> he said, Arnie would stab someone with a knife. That's what he said. Hmm. So, which is crazy because obviously this comes into play later when we talk about the murder. Yeah. So, Carl Sr., the dad... Um, he finally admitted that he was, like, a believer. He finally was like, okay, shit's getting real. Because yeah. he also said that he saw the face of the beast, is what they called it. The face of the beast. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking this whole time, you've been telling your son he's, you know, overreacting or whatever. And you actually saw it? Like, what a douche. But whatever. The Catholic Church finally dispatched multiple priests to come check out the house and the boy and all this to make sure this is all legit. And, sorry about that. That was my doggie. Um, so, yeah, they dispatched all these priests. And, <clears throat> hold on. <coughs> sorry. Me. One of the priests and Ed Warren were in the boys' room. They were, like, at his bedside, either kneeling or praying or whatever. When David began to levitate off the bed and onto the ceiling of his bedroom... They realized after this investigation that an exorcism needed to be done. Huh. Duh. Ed and Lorraine already knew that, but they were trying to convince the Catholic Church. Yeah. The Catholic Church, however, didn't do a full exorcism right away. What? They did, like, kind of mini ones, I guess you could say. They're called something, but I don't really know what the direct term. So, like, term. the first stage is and stuff. Yeah, they did, they like, do small the exorcisms. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... We've went over exorcisms before, and most all kind of do the same thing. Like, they have different stages. Yeah. Um, and each stage is harder. Yeah. So, during these sessions, his body would become distorted. Um, it would contort in unnatural ways. You know, he yeah. would start lashing out at the priest. He would start lashing and spitting, cursing, all those things. This beast was very powerful, and the Warrens were telling the church the only way that this is going to work is if we do a major rites of an exorcism. So, like, the, the big one, you know? Yeah. Um, not like these small mini-sessions that we're doing because this isn't working. They tried to explain to the church that this boy could die or worse, kill someone or, you know, something crazy is going to happen. And one night, Arnie was actually on his way to the grocery store to, like, pick up some things for the family. While he was, like, before he got in his car, he got in his car, and before he started it up, he saw a black mist, like, over on the road or something, and it was pointing towards a tree. He said the car started itself and then drove straight into the tree, and he crashed into the tree. 
What? He was fine. Luckily, yeah. he was okay. But, yeah. The That's car crazy. crushed into the tree. Yeah. So, as the winter came, David's attacks kind of were getting lesser and lesser, which is a good thing. However, Arnie and Debbie, at this point, decided that they needed to, like, move out. They were, like, tired of it. They couldn't handle it anymore, and they wanted to move out. So, they leased a small apartment from Alan Bono. The apartment was close to where Debbie worked, and it was also close to the Glatzel home, so they could get to David if they needed to, like, get there quickly, because, I mean, David was still possessed this entire time. Mm -hmm. It was just, it wasn't as bad as it was, I guess. I guess the demons, a lot of times we see that, and that's when the demons are, like, getting wore down. So, Alan, Arnie, and Debbie, they had, a lot of people said they were all, like, really good friends. Um... Arnie and Alan would, like, go to the bars together, you know, after work or whatever and have a few drinks. They would all hang out together. After moving to the apartment, Debbie said that Arnie's behavior started to change, though. He would become entranced. Like, he would be standing in front of the window and just looking out at it, not mm -hmm. moving or anything like that. And she'd be like, are you okay, you know? And yeah. then <clears throat> he would also have hallucinations as well, and he would have, like, no memory of the hallucinations or standing there like he'd be like what are you talking about i don't remember any of that you know yeah. um before all the things started with david and the possession people said that arnie was like a nice boy he was hard working he loved everyone ed and lorraine even said that he was a wonderful young man and they could never see him hurting anybody like he was just and he was super nice to david like he so i mean this he's is Hang on, this is the 19-year-old, right? The 19-year-old, yeah. Yeah, okay. Arnie's the one that wanted the demons to come into, to come him, into him because he they, said he could take it. Yeah, and he wanted okay. them to leave David alone. So this is not a dude that's like... At this point, we have no evidence to suggest that he had a rough childhood or he was a psycho or yeah. anything like that. So as the town was celebrating its 193 years... Without a murder, something sinister was about to happen. On February 16th, 1981, Arnie Johnson murdered Alan Bono with a five-inch pocket knife. It took place in Alan's apartment. So, Alan had been drinking wine for most of the day and insisted that Arnie, Debbie, and Arnie's three sisters kind of stay over and have dinner. Debbie said that she didn't want to stay. She wanted to go home because Alan was intoxicated and he was being kind of obnoxious. So she just wanted to leave with her three sisters and go back to their apartment, right? Yeah. Alan with Bono, the guy that got killed, he was getting upset as the women um, were trying to leave. And so... Where was I? Sorry, I had to pause. Um, <clears throat> what's the last thing I said? Uh, I don't know. Oh, Alan was getting upset oh. because the women were trying to leave. And they said that he then stuck his arm out and tried to block the entrance of the door. He grabbed the arm of one of Arnie's sisters... His little sister, I think. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, like, trying to attack them or anything. But he just grabbed their, grabbed her arm and was like, no, don't leave. I think he was kind of also being a little flirty, you know, because he was yeah. drunk and all this. All of a sudden, at this point, Arnie went into a rage. He actually attacked <sighs> Debbie, his girlfriend. He attacked her first. He kicked her in the stomach and slammed her on the floor, which I mm -hmm. thought was really odd. Um, And then... After, sorry, I had a bug on me. Uh, so, I didn't know what it was. It was huge. Did you see it? What was yeah. that? Okay. Something so, bit me. So, sorry, we're outside. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he he attacked Debbie. Slung her to the floor and was, you know, beating her up, basically. Alan then says... He, he's like, hey, man, come come on, I'll fight you, you know, I'll fight you. Because I guess he's thinking he's trying to beat up his girlfriend. And he's like, you don't need to beat up your girlfriend, yeah. you know, I'll kick your ass, I'll fight you. In that moment, Debbie said there was a flash of silver in the air. And then Alan Bono drops to the ground. And Arnie wasn't even anywhere near him. Wow. 
Everyone in the room said Arnie started growling like an animal and then all of a sudden ran out the door and started running towards the woods in the behind the apartments. The girls all noticed after this that Alan Bono was bleeding on the ground and the knife was bloody beside him at his feet. They also said that they weren't going to touch it because it appeared like the knife was glowing. Glowing? Mm Mm-hmm. Alan had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and stomach. One of the knife wounds even went for, like, his stomach to his heart. Like, mm-hmm. it like it was drug upwards. Debbie immediately called her mom. Because, you know, I don't know why she didn't immediately call the police. But I guess every, this is a close community. So, she just was, like, frantic calling her mom, you know. Yeah. She called her mom. And then they quickly, like, headed over. David, however, the little boy was in the background and he was like he he said he knew what happened he said the beast he was yelling to he was yelling to debbie while she was on the phone and he was in the background and he was like the beast did it no one saw it he just killed with a knife no one saw it he went into arnie and stabbed alan all the helpers are here laugh are there laughing the beast stabbed alan five times so yeah wow. that's what that's what David said so it's almost like the beast David was saying the beast possessed Arnie stabbed Alan and then Al, you know Arnie took off because he was still possessed I guess so Judy Carl Sr. they get there the girls are frantic they're outside the dad Carl Sr. calls 911 Mm -hmm. Brookfield police during this time were on the lookout for Arnie Johnson and at the time Arnie was uh, Alan was pronounced dead like even before they made it to the hospital so the police finally found Arnie hours later wandering down a road about a mile away from the murder site he was in a trance and couldn't really remember anything that happened and he said I think I may have hurt someone which is at the beginning of the trailer for the movie after they arrested him, he was charged with first-degree murder. So, yeah, he couldn't really remember anything. And he pretty much just gave himself up because he was standing there. And he was like, I think I hurt someone. But, like, he couldn't remember. And he was just, like, dazed, you know? Hmm. So now let's talk about the trial. This obviously broke news, made national headlines. Martin Malin. Manella, Manella, I think. That was the lawyer that was going to be Arnie's lawyer. He saw this in the paper and he was like super intrigued. He decided they were going to say that Arnie was going to plead not guilty for reason of demonic possession. Martin was sure that after talking to the Warrens, the Glatzels, David, Arnie's sisters that were there that night, yeah. um, he would be able to show the court and the jury that Arnie was possessed by a demon And that's why he killed Alan. He was also going to use the tapes where David, you know, had said earlier, Arnie's going to kill someone with Mm. a knife. He was going to use the tapes. He was going to get everyone involved, even priest involved. This is like a very controversial thing because this is bringing together church and state, which usually they're like church and state, church and state are separate. You know, we've learned that. (laughs) So Debbie... Glatzel and her mom Judy came out to the public and told them what had happened to David because before this they kind of kept it private you know Mm -hmm. Judy also begged like on TV she was begging the Catholic Church that David still needed to have a full exorcism performed because he was still possessed I mean keep in mind this child still possessed and insulting I mean it's not as bad but he still hasn't had a full exorcism yet. But then he's <laughs> possessed, but then he's also, t- after the murder, he told them, like, the demons did it. Yeah. Like, that's weird. And now Arnie is, obviously got possessed or something and killed this man. So that's what everybody's thinking, okay? Um, so, the Catholic Church, however, was refusing... To say anything on the matter. They even came out and said that they didn't perform any of those exorcisms. What? They didn't know David. They didn't know Arnie. They didn't perform any of those small exorcisms or nothing like that. And some of the, I believe now, 
some of the priests that were in that situation, yeah. some of the younger priests, they were, like, sent to different places. Like, they just sent them to different dioceses and stuff like that. So, that is so weird. Well, I'm thinking that if that's true, if the Catholic Church really did perform these small exorcisms, they're always secretive about exorcisms in the first place. Which I'm like, why? I mean, we're not dumb. We know demons and ghosts and angels and all that exists. So, just, yeah. like, fucking whatever. I mean, you exactly. know, you don't have to pretend, like, no, this doesn't happen. Like, what? <laughs> Anyways. So, um... I guess they didn't want it to be associated with a murder, but it was going to be really, really hard for this guy to get him completely off using possession anyways. I mean, that's never, yeah. ever been done. So, I just didn't see the point in them not helping David out. They decided... they just didn't want to be involved with it. I guess. Um, so the Warrens and David's family decided while the trial was still going on that they were going to take David out of the country to try to get someone to perform this exorcism because he was getting worse. They took him to Canada and they submitted an 18 page report to a priest in Canada. And on November 7th, 1982, David, David finally got the exorcism that he needed to get. And it only took this priest 30 minutes to get the demons out. Wow. Yeah, 30 minutes. Maybe and all this shit could have been done. Yeah, maybe that's the reason. Because they knew that they were guilty and they knew that... Are you saying that if they would have done it, yeah. maybe... Yeah. Arnie well, it took them 30 have. minutes. Yeah. So, all that... All the witnesses um, said that the demon finally revealed the truth. He revealed his true name and his name was Beelzebub. Which is like the art... The art angel demon or whatever yeah so the warrens and the priest finally after talking to david and expelling the demon and in this session the demon was talking to them as well they finally found out what happened and why this family was targeted this shit's crazy mm -hmm. turns out months before things all started happening the family the glatzko family took a trip to like a ski resort well, while they were there, they met this other family, and they kind of hit it off a, a, kind of well. But then they had, like, this falling out while they were there, and they just kind of get a weird vibe from them. So they stopped, like, hanging out with them and being friends or whatever. Yeah. Well, it turns out that this family was into satanic things. Hoping to gain power by offering the innocent soul of the first and last born child of the Glatzkull family to the devil, they decided to um, perform a satanic ritual. To what? possess these children. That yeah. is crazy. All this information is coming from the demon through um, David during the possession. Yeah. Okay. So, the demon also said the curse was placed on them on February 16th, some winters back. Which is also the same day Arnie killed Alan a year later with a knife coincidence i think not yeah it's weird <laughs> i thought that was really crazy too many coincidences i just thought that was really strange like that was yeah. like so he they bought that rental home so maybe nothing really had to do with the rental home i don't understand why that woman said that though the tenant yeah. about there being which that house could have been haunted in itself but maybe i don't know it's just weird i don't know so Arnie Johnson was charged with first-degree manslaughter of Alan's death, not murder. So, that's kind of a, a good thing, I guess. But Arnie did serve um, time. He only served five years, though, and then he got out for good behavior because he was, like, a model prisoner. Because, mm. you know, he said that the Beast did um, visit him several times while he was in prison. And Debbie and Arnold, Arnie got married after he got out. The Glatzkill home there... In the Glasgow home, there's apparently still some weird activity that goes on, like, to this day, and things that happen to the family. And the Beast claimed that it would kill again. That's what it's told. Like, I think even Debbie's kids and Arnie's kids have seen some things before. So, yeah. That is the case of... So, he still went to prison. So, moral of the story, don't try to say that a demon possessed you and that's why you killed somebody because you're still going to go to prison. Yeah. But there was tons of evidence 
to back it up. Now, I will say that, who is it? I believe it's Carl Jr., maybe? I can't remember. Or Carl, I don't think it's Carl Sr., I think it's Carl Jr. Anyways, he, the brother, David's brother. Yeah. He actually sued the Warrens, um... Because he said that they were trying to just make a dollar off of the possession, you know, and because yeah. they, I guess, blew it up to more than it could have been or something like that. Um, my, my one thing is this, like, if I was going to murder somebody and use something as an, <laughs> as an excuse, like, if you're saying, well, yeah. he just used, if you're saying, well, he just used the demonic possession as an excuse... Why wouldn't he just say Alan attacked my sisters? Yeah, or, Alan that would be let the last leave, thing I would say because no one's gonna believe that. We got into an argument and Alan, like Alan, didn't attack his sisters. But what I'm saying is, is I mean, they could all come up with an alibi and been like, "Yeah, Alan attacked us," and then you know, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying that would now have been the last was... thing because people weren't gonna believe that. People aren't gonna believe that. Possession? That would have been a yeah. stupid thing to do if it was that. Yeah. You mean if it wasn't? If it... If no, it wasn't if, it wa- if it was, he was just thinking, oh, I'm just going to tell him I was possessed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I will say, on the stand, there were some conflicting things between Al- Ar- Arnie's sisters that were there. Like, their testimony to the police opposed to what they said on the stand. It was kind of different, but it wasn't anything major, I don't think. Um, I don't think they talked about the glowing knife anymore. Maybe that wasn't in there. But, yeah. It was the first case of Let me demonic tell you possession. If The Conjuring doesn't have every detail, I don't want anything messed up. Because this is a good-ass movie. Yeah. A good-ass movie. Especially if, if that's true about the family <coughs> that they met on that mountain trip. They were satanic devil worshippers that yeah. wanted to gain power by... Which I'm not saying all satanic people do that. There are people that just worship the devil and think he's great. And they don't try to harm anybody else. Mm. I'm not that person. But I'm just saying. <laughs> um, these people obviously wanted power from the devil by giving the firstborn son and the lastborn son. Which is why they targeted David. And Carl Jr. eventually got some of it. I mean, he yeah. did get kind of, you know, angry and all that. So, yeah. Some people did say that... Um, oh, no, I know what it was. Yes, it was Carl Jr. He's the one that sued the Warrens because he said that his brother did actually have a mental illness. But then a lot of people are saying he didn't. Like, even his mom and, you know other sister and all that were like he didn't have a mental illness he wasn't mentally ill he was just he had a learning disability that was it yeah so I don't know but yeah I'm excited to see the movie I hope that they don't put I think they're gonna put a witch in it you know Why? come on <laughs> guys Hollywood just stick to it it's yeah. good it's great it sort of been I mean I hope that they bring the old man being a devil I hope, oh and come to find out when they were doing the possession also I forgot to mention this there wasn't 42 demons. Hmm. He was the only demon. Huh. But he was just very good at manipulation and making himself look different to David hmm. that David thought there were multiple ones. Yeah. So, yeah. It's crazy. It's cool. <sighs> that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm that's, like, oh my god, that's cool. That's great. That's awesome. That's that's initiative. That's, he's not lazy that's at all. That's talent. <laughs> he's pushing through. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Weird enough to say that. Yeah. Let's let's go pray. Um so anyways. Let's go pray. <laughs> so, <coughs> so we hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. We will see you guys next Friday. We'll have another episode for you. Make sure to like, subscribe, all that jazz. Also, you can um go to our Apple iTunes and please, please, please leave us a review. It helps us out a lot when you do that. It helps us know if you guys like us or not or if you want to shut up and leave and never come back. Um, (laughs) Also, like I said, Friday, next Friday, we will have a 
older episode, but if you don't follow us on YouTube, then you will have never have heard this episode, so it's going to be good. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's the other possession case, the one we did before. But the first one that we've ever done? Yeah, I'm either going to do that or Waverly, Waverly Hospital. I don't know, I haven't decided. So anywho, all right, well, we hope that you guys have a great, fantastic weekend, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye!